Sorry? You know, if I had it, if I had it, you know, I would have worn it. Because I know. I like that one. I like that. You have to know that any presentation of mine is going to have a theatrical open. So. Yeah, I know. That's what I thought. So that's why. Yeah. Once my two other committee members get here, uh, we'll get rolling. About half an hour. -ish. Started here in a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You can sit wherever, wherever you are. Okay, so I, I have one request here. I have one request of all of you here. Uh, listen, so the camera is set up because my mom's on the other end. I need you all to make you look really good. Just make you look really good. So just just so we're clear here. <laughs> All right. So it's should we, yeah. should we get going? Okay. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for showing up today for James uh, thesis defense. James King. He got his undergraduate degree here in in geography. No, just geography. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And then he did a little stint in history and then came over to, to geosciences. And he's, he's been interested in space for a very long time, as you can see from his outfit, his, his um, science officer outfit. One might say my choice of attire is uh, logical. Okay. So, <laughs> so he's going to talk about uh, asteroids and remote sensing. He's going to begin with a little bit of history. And then he's going to move into some uh, basic image processing of some of the images from some of the, the orbiters around uh, Mars and some asteroids. And then a big surprise at the end that I won't give up. So thank you. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. So uh, thank you all for being here. Yes, this is uh, my master's thesis on improving asteroid remote sensing by utilizing past Martian methods. Uh, so before we start, um, let me turn this on. Get there. All right. So thank you all for being here. Uh, but we're here to talk about space. Uh, if you're if you're here and you know me, you know there's an element of theater to everything I do. So uh, I'm trying to make this not only as educational and informative, but also as entertaining as I possibly can. Because you're going to have to sit here for about half an hour uh, and hear me drone on about space. Hear me drone on about space. So uh, let's start with an introduction to how I got here, because I feel like every voyage starts with a single idea for a first step. Uh, I started looking at Triton. If you are unfamiliar with Triton, Triton is a moon of Neptune uh, that I thought was exceptionally cool because it has ice volcanoes. That's going to sound uh, pretty weird, but it's very cool. And it was something I looked at, and I talked to Dr. Steve about this, and I was like, wow, this is a great idea. And the very first thing he said was, show me the data. Just show me the data. Uh, well, I could. Uh, there was only Voyager 2. Voyager 2 back in, I think, 1986 was the last data set I had from Triton. Uh, so I had to continue moving on and trying to refine my idea. I knew I wanted to do something about space. Uh, again, as you can see, my choice of attire today, uh, I've obviously been influenced by things in my life. So I started having some evolving ideas. And I started looking at other 
bodies outside of the normal uh, region of space that we come to know. So uh, before we continue, I also want to drop a definition here. If you, talk, if you hear me talk about deep space, uh, deep space is in reference to anything that exists outside of the realm of Earth and the Moon. So deep space is anything that exists outside the realm of the Earth and the Moon. So when I refer to deep space, uh, this is what I'm talking about. So I eventually came up with Dawn. Dawn was a probe that was launched back in 2007 by NASA and was sent to study the two largest bodies in the asteroid belt, which were Ceres and Vesta. Ceres and Vesta. Uh, Vesta, of which you are going to hear much about as I continue through this. Uh, this is Dawn, by the way. All right. So I had to address the problem. And as I went and I looked at the amount of orbiters, the amount of missions that were launched into space, I noticed that there was a bit of a disparity. And I'm going to keep using that word as we go through here, the word disparity. And what we see here is that the Earth, Mars, and Venus have had uh, almost a massive litany, if you will, uh, of launches that were sent to study them. Uh, but I didn't understand why there were very few in comparison in deep space because there are still things that deep space can tell us. Uh, so I thought, wow, what a waste of space. What a waste of space. And I couldn't figure out uh, why we weren't prioritizing uh, what I kept seeing referred to as the great beyond. Uh, the areas beyond our closest neighbors. Okay. Uh, so I noticed there was also a disparity, not only in quantity of data, but in quality. And at this point in time, I had actually gone down a, a path where I was considering maybe doing a thesis on a uh, database, on making a database for something, an easily accessible database. Uh, but I came up with the research questions. How can I learn from established practices to improve future missions and perhaps to even make them easier into deep space? This is where I started. Uh, I started with Mars. So Mars, as we know, is a current target for future human expansion, right? Uh, human colonization, perhaps in the future. So there are many, and when I say many, I mean many studies currently going on on Mars. But then I also had to look at Dawn, because Dawn had a few unique traits uh, that I will be talking about as I uh, get to these. But this right here, uh, this is Vesta. This is Vesta here. And we talk about Vesta a lot. Vesta has the distinction of being the very first asteroid that was completely mapped very first completely mapped asteroid is Vesta, and it is the second largest object. So, let's move on. My methodology. Where am I going to start? What am I going to do? Well, I decided to look to the past uh, to see how we got to where we are, to maybe try and find out why there is this, again, this disparity uh, in deep space remote sensing compared to just looking at our closest neighbors. Uh, I looked at the history of probes. We're going to talk about a few of those, too. Uh, I looked at Dawn. Dawn takes up a considerable amount of my research, as that mission was uh, kind of a watershed moment for deep space remote sensing when it comes to asteroids. Uh, and I looked at Mars, and I did a little bit of imagery analysis between the two. Uh, I wanted to look at the data and get an idea for how much of a difference existed between these. But what was I going to do with it? Well, we need to look to the future. And maybe find a probe to pave the way. And I'm going to let my secret out now. I made one. We'll get to that. So we talked about history. If we talk about space exploration, we have to start with something very important. The Cold War. The Cold War. Uh, so we remember, uh, maybe, I'm not trying to call anyone out here, if you were around when JFK stood and said, we choose to go to the moon, and set up things, uh, was basically our answer to the fact that the Russians had beaten us in space. Uh, as you might not be aware of, when it comes to moments that are first in space exploration, uh, the Russians have a great deal more than we do, but where did we set some good ones? So let's talk about one in particular that I started with was Lunar Orbiter 1. Lunar Orbiter 1. Uh, Lunar Orbiter 1 was our very first steps into deep space remote sensing, and you might say, well, James, you said that deep space was beyond uh, the Earth and the Moon. Uh, you're right, but baby steps, friends, we have to get there. So, let's talk about Lunar Orbiter 1. Lunar Orbiter 1 gave us our very first view of Earth from the Moon. 
very first view of Earth from the moon. Uh, it utilized the Eastman Kodiak camera with 70 millimeter film uh, with a 45 foot resolution. Uh, at this time, these cameras were employed by the United States military. And what we got here were raster images that were 2.67 by 65 millimeters in size. And they were beamed back to Earth's later radius. And these were reconstructed using something called GRE, ground reconstruction equipment. And one thing I want to draw attention to here, do you see these lines in this image? These are an image that has been mosaic together that were sent back. Each one put together to create this image of our home planet uh, from our closest satellite. So. But then I looked at Venera. Venera. Uh, Venus. I'm uh, kind of glossing over. Uh, I talked about it quite a few bit more of these, but I wanted to pick out the really important ones here. Uh, and honestly, I could give you a whole hour long lecture about these, but I'm not going to try to keep you for that long. Half an hour at best. Uh, talk about Venera 9. And Venera 9 uh, holds the distinction of sending back the very first images from Venus. Uh, if you are unfamiliar with Venus, uh, Venus is actually our closest planetary neighbor. Uh, Mars exists a great deal further than Venus does to us, but Venus is deeply inhospitable. Uh, a lot of the probes that were sent there uh, were destroyed or did not survive for very long, but Venera gave us this. A 170 degree panoramic picture uh, using a telephoner with a 128 by 512 uh, 6 bit resolution image, and you got this panoramic image around the mirror. And, uh, we talk about a panoramic telephoner, uh, they use the television camera. It was the closest approximation I can give you, is that it is a television camera. Continuing on, we did one for the moon, we did one for Venus, and now we're going to start with one for Mars that felt important. And this is Mariner 4. And Mariner 4 sent back the very first orbital images from Mars. This was our very first look at the red planet. And just to give you an idea of when this happened, this happened in 1965. By this point, War of the Worlds, which was about Mars, had existed for 70 years before we even got a picture of the planet. Uh, and this was 200 by 200 uh, six bit image uh, that was about 17,000 kilometers above Mars. Uh, with a 1.5 degree field. So let's talk about Mars a little bit. Right now, we're kind of at a Martian Renaissance. Because we know that we're looking ahead. We are trying to eventually put humanity on Mars. Right. So, one thing I drew attention to, I uh, had a lot of data about uh, the disparity between Mars and other things, but I'm going to draw attention to this. This is the amount of active missions every year around the red planet. As you can see, they have only increased in scale as we have gotten uh, further along this 24-year uh, gap here, 24, 25 years. Uh, so to give you an idea, uh, there are roughly, I think right now, it's 13 active missions around Mars at this moment. That's just Mars. Why aren't we looking beyond? Well, let me set another uh, give you another idea, is that while there are 13 around Mars, does anybody have a guess how many there are in the solar system outside of Mars and Venus right now? And Earth, anybody want to take a guess? You can't, you know. <laughs> okay. Five? Okay, that's a good, that's a very good guess. Uh, it's eight. Eight. It is a very large solar system out there, and there are only eight things out there currently. Eight things. So I'll take a minute to talk about philosophy, because at this point in time, I realized that the way that we have been exploring space is something that I fundamentally disagree with. Uh, is what we've been doing is we decide on a target location that we want to go explore, and then what we do is we design a probe or a satellite to go explore. And this means that every single project has a specially designed, specially built piece of equipment for it. This is very, very, very expensive. Uh, and this is where I realized that I think the way we've been going about it could use some. Try to find my question. Why have we not explored more? Well, I broke this down. Time. Uh, to give you an idea, let's talk about Dawn. Dawn was launched in 2007. It did not reach its target. That's that until 2011. That's four years of transit. That is four years of which the project had to be funded 
staff before a single image even came back. Okay. Uh, the average cost, this one, this one's a big one. You're, you're going to hear me harp on this one a lot. The average cost, uh, the average cost to sustain a mission into deep space, not to build it, not to launch it, to sustain it, is $300 million. $300 million. That's a lot. I also explored, is it just a lack of imagination? I felt it was worth exploring because we know that after the 70s, we kind of stopped going to the moon, which I still don't understand, but I kind of ruled that one out. And I thought it was worth mentioning. I don't think it's a lack of imagination. I think there's a lot of people out there that, uh, like me, grew up on things telling them to go explore. So. so I got into cost. This is where I really started to um, come into my research, was understanding that the cost was what was prohibiting so much of this exploration. Uh, the average cost, as I mentioned, is $300 million. Uh, and the cost of construction is usually in the hundreds of millions of dollars, but the parts are also sometimes specially sourced, specially created. Uh, they will have uh, pieces of equipment that are built just for that, and then not built again. We just won't see it again. And we also have uh, rare metals that are necessary to construct and maintain the integrity of some of these parts over time. Uh, space in a hostile environment. So that said, they're not inherently profitable. Well, at this point in time, I ran the risk of getting into uh, having a business thesis, so I decided to uh, kind of pivot on this and get back into the science, and I realized the solution was the end. It was logical. So, where did I go? I started with Dawn. So, Dawn was launched in 2007. Uh, and was created to study series investment. Created to study series investment. Uh, and this actually utilized some experimental technologies. We talked about how some of these technologies were built specifically for some of these, and this utilized an experimental xenon ion engine. And that might sound like some science fiction stuff, and it actually is really kind of cool. Uh, this is an engine that takes xenon gas and ionizes it and very slowly pushes it up back to the spacecraft, and once it is up to full speed, it can move to its target up to eight times faster than previous spaceflight methods. Uh, and it also used hydrazine thrusters uh, for maneuvering, which was a fairly new technology. But this one, this one, we're going to talk about this. This is the framing camera. The framing camera. Because at its core, my research is about remote sensing. So I looked into a lot of cameras. And we're going to talk about the framing camera that's created by a German company. But it eventually reached Vesta in 2011. And I believe this was maybe a bit of a personal uh, thought here. This is the current benchmark, I think, with deep space remote sensing. It completely mapped an entire uh, extraplanetary model. Uh, it gave us a lot of information that we previously did not have and opened a lot of doors for future research. Uh, the camera itself covered bands from uh, red, green, blue, RGB, if you can say that from here on out. Uh, NIR is near infrared, uh, IR infrared, and UV, ultraviolet. Uh, and again, this created the first complete map of an asteroid. So let's talk about the framing camera. I like this thing. This is neat. Uh, the sense of scale is a little bit off here. It's maybe roughly like two feet tall. About two feet tall. Uh, and it was a dual mounted radiance capturing uh, framing camera that it did have two shutters uh, that closed to help protect it during flight. Uh, and it was roughly 5.5 kilograms uh, per camera and utilize a 16 to 32 bit uh, bit rate compression. You will note from here on out, I will actually start drawing attention to weight. Actually start drawing attention to weight. Because as we get to uh, the secret that I revealed, uh, weight became an important factor as I researched how to build this. Uh, but I also attempted focal length. Uh, so it's 150 meter, uh, millimeter focal length with a 4.5, 5.46 degree aperture. And it does measure various wavelengths uh, from RGB and IR. IR and UV. Uh, and it averages roughly 16.5 meters per pixel, and this varies uh, with CAMO from here on out has a high altitude mapping orbit, and LAMO is a low altitude mapping orbit. And this was created to map uh, geologic and geomorphological features uh, to help chart things that have occurred on this body. This is Vesta. This is uh, the, as I've come to call it, uh, the lumpy potato. So you take a potato, just just like pull a potato out of a bag. There you go. You've got Vesta, basically. Uh, it is this. Uh, it is not a spheroid 
complex series. It is this oblong, kind of like uh, deeply oblate object. Uh, and this is an image of a mosaic that was taken that is roughly 21 meters per pixel here. Uh, 21 meters, uh, the resolution on that, if you're familiar uh, with what is considered at least decent spatial resolution, that's not great. Uh, it's really not great. So, move along. I decided that to get a good image, a good um, analysis, a good analysis to compare to a better camera or another camera, I needed to get as close as I possibly could. So I looked at an area called the Domna region. And this was taken during a LAMO, uh, a low altitude mapping orbit, and it's roughly 12 meters per pixel. Well, looking at this image, I was like, okay, well, I have this image. What can I do with it? What can we possibly glean from this image? What can we take from this? So the very first thing I did, so for the noise reduction, I smoothed it out a little bit, make it easier to use. Uh, so what we have here is the image. It's fine, you can like game that as loving like I did for page upon page upon hours. It's cool. All right. Then I conducted a slope analysis. And a slope analysis tells us how extreme some of the topographic features are. Gives us an idea for what we're looking at, for uh, how varied uh, that the surface actually is. And after I did that, I decided just a little bit further. Uh, I decided, I was eager to have some for this, by the way. Uh, what I did was I created a chart, and this chart right here uh, charts the slope and where the pixels on what slope they are, what slope they are measuring. So this looks like a hot mess. So I made it a little bit cleaner. I smoothed it out, did a statistical analysis, and the average slope of that image is roughly 61.45 degrees, which that is very, very, very good. All right. So what does Dawn teach us? What does Dawn teach us? Well, the good, uh, the surface features of asteroids. We completely mapped an asteroid. How cool is that? Uh, but it also teaches us the composition of extraplanetary bodies because it was sent out to help ascertain what it was also made of. Uh, but it also helps flush out the events that took place during the formation of our solar system. And asteroids are the remnants of bodies that have been left over from the creation of our solar system that have gone into orbit uh, between Mars and uh, Jupiter. But the bad, temporal resolution is not great. Temporal resolution is not great. That's what was not there for very long. So an idea of, do these features change over time? Uh, does this change take place over long periods of time, short periods of time? It's very difficult to ascertain. Uh, so also, any knowledge outside of the mission profile would be very difficult to find. Uh, also, we haven't been back. We haven't been back. And as far as I know, there is absolutely no current mission slated to go back. So there's that. Let's look at the opposite. Let's look at high rise. Uh, so high rise is attached to the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And this is, uh, uh, as my advisor and I have come to talk about some of our uh, cameras, we, we talk about them in expensive cars. Uh, this, is, this is the Rolls Royce. Uh, this, this right here is very good. High rise, oh, too far. <laughs> Uh, high rise is to give you an idea. I'm actually going to show you a comparison here a little bit. Uh, this is like spy satellite level. Uh, this is down to 11 inch resolution. And this is better than a lot of the uh, civilian data you can get uh, here in here on Earth. I mean, if you look at things like uh, Sentinel and uh, Landsat, uh, it, it doesn't compare. It doesn't compare. Uh, the great part about these is uh, they are freely available online. Uh, which also added another thing. We're like finding Vesta. Uh, the last images from Vesta were from 2011. Uh, I found an image from March 1st. And then I went online later and found an image from March 5th. And then an image from March 7th. Uh, if you're getting an idea here, I talked about temporal resolution. This is amazing. Uh, this, this has been taking pictures of Mars for a long time. Uh, we look at things, we go back. Uh, I chose a random, I chose a random swap to get a look at, and I chose this one in the Northern Hemisphere of Mars, and yes, this image was taken last month on another planet. Want to see how good the imagery is? Holy crap, it's good. <laughs> uh, 
so this swath was taken by the University of Arizona to um, measure marching buildings, which is something I was looking into during this research. Uh, so I put a chart together to compare these two sensors, the dawn framing camera and high rise. And notice that high rise, first off, is enormous, 65 kilograms, a massive camera. Uh, I found an image of them putting it together, and it's like three people standing around this massive uh, like cylindrical object with almost a two and a half foot lens. Uh, so the cost also, again, we're coming back to this, we're gonna circle back here, uh, prohibitively expensive. $24 million and 40 for high rise. Also, uh, high rise sets 14 bands, which is double of what Don does. Uh, also the focal length and is different here. Also the um, resolution, look at the resolution. I mean, that's, it, it's incredible. 1.3 meters in a high altitude orbit um, and only 30 centimeters at a low altitude mapping orbit compared to Dawn, uh, which is in meters and not single digit meters, meters. So, all right. Oh, no, that's there. So I needed to look ahead. I needed to put all this together. I was like, all right, I've identified my problem. It's expensive. Everything's expensive and custom made. Uh, every time we go out there, uh, we make a gold plated Rolls Royce every time. That can no longer be the case. Uh, we need a customizable, modular system to explore the solar system. Uh, and it needs to be light. It needs to be light. Getting things off the ground is also a part of the cost. Uh, the thrust to weight ratio, the cost for that is, it's a lot. Uh, that's why it's going to be in the millions of dollars if you just want to get off the ground. Go up into space, any of us would want to go. It has to be cheap. And if it has to be cheap, it has to be mass producing. Uh, and here, my philosophy came down to um, instead of making uh, that golden bullet that we shoot out in space at a target, maybe instead we should take a scattershot approach. And I think I had mentioned multiple times that I came to this with the idea that we should build something that isn't $100 million, but would be 10 somethings for $10 million. That's awfully low, but you know, the idea, you get the idea. This is Vegeta. <laughs> this is Vegeta. This is my satellite. This right here is the Variable Exploration and Geoplanetary Transmission Array. And a friend of mine who managed to 3D print this, you can get a chance to actually hold the gene in your hand. Please hold this by the body. Do not hold this by okay, the solar, right here, <laughs> not by the solar panels. Okay. I designed this out. This is a concept model, and I tried to, listen, I'm not an engineer. I need to run, so I'm not an engineer, but I take pride in this. Talk about it. So let's talk about the technical specifications of a genome. So what we have here is I decided to go with the uh, xenon ion propulsion uh, using a system called NSTAR that NASA has developed. Uh, and it would also use the hydrogen corrective thrusters and would be roughly 425 kilograms, roughly 1,000 pounds. Uh, for navigation, it would also use its framing cameras. So I'm kind of borrowing from Dawn here. I'm borrowing the framing cameras, which I thought were really neat. Uh, they were well built, uh, they were reliable, and they would be used both for navigation. Uh, so when you navigate a deep space probe, that's a bit like the age of sail, where we do it by the stars, okay? But sensor package, the sensor package was the framing camera. And this is very important, we're gonna talk more about this. This one is uh, designed my own framing camera to go with this. Uh, but also, it would have to be connected to the deep space network which is what NASA uses to collect data uh, from probes out in space with a 1.5 meter high gain dish. So, and that would vary in both size and weight. And like I said, this needs to be customizable. So what I built here, this is the chassis for future things going forward. What are we gonna build on top of this? There needs to be something that we can just drop things into. Well, we're not done. Let's talk about the framing camera. Let's talk about the framing camera. Well, I decided to go with something compact and lightweight. Uh, I didn't want something like the 65 kilograms of high rise because we need something that is basic. I am not building the Rolls Royce, I'm building the Honda Civic. <laughs> Th that's what we're building here, okay? We need something that is reliable, customizable, and launchable. Uh, the, so the cost here would be very, uh, the camera would be able to be outfitted with a variety of lenses or filters if needed. 
uh, but the stock bands would only be RGB and IR and IR. You might think, well, we need more for space exploration. Come back to that. Uh, focal length for 150, uh, 150 millimeters. Uh, and I would like the resolution to only be about five meters. About five meters. And I feel like this is probably the lowest that we can get away with. Uh, so, the question is how do we customize it? The same system. I, you will notice that along the top, along the top of uh, the satellite, there are six indentions. This is a substitutable apparatus uh, indention nodes. These are substitutable, uh, basically modular objects that you can put in here to change your mission profile. And these systems would allow for a variety of equipment to be in play. So, uh, one of the things that really caught my eye and when I started with this, my first idea for this was looking at Rapid Eye. Uh, Rapid Eye was a series of satellites that were, uh, we refer to them as uh, the Bread Box. It's the Bread Box, and there were a few of them that were in a network that traveled around Earth taking pictures at various points in time. Uh, where that would probably, what if I were to have to build one of these right now, this is where it would start. Uh, and this is where we would get into Vegeta being a transmission array. So what it would do is it would collect data from all of the little uh, satellites and cameras that were rotating around it and allow it to transmit back to Earth. So it would do the heavy lifting instead of having these small little red boxes have to do. Uh, TV-90, let's take a look at it. So this is the top of Vegeta. So we have uh, the sensor package module will be right here. Uh, the front-facing camera, so this would be my framing camera. And then my deep space uh, network transmitter will also be on the top. And each one of them, you see the indention nodes, substitutable apparatus indention nodes, and it would run off the photo locator array to help keep it powered during the flight. And it would also have a rear-facing camera, and the xenon ion thrusters would be on the rear of the vessel. So my solution, my solution was that deep space remote sensing needs to be customizable, and it needs to be modular. And what we needed was an idea. We needed a jumping off point. And that's what Vegeta and the same system are, is that jumping off point. And this would be the current model. Uh, this would help turn an unsustainable current model of launching a golden Rolls Royce every time we want to explore something into something more affordable and simple. And it's important. I, I really feel like one of the things I, I wanted to talk more about but I had a couple of times was the importance of space exploration for us and understanding what is around us why exploring the solar system is important so we can understand uh, how our solar system formed and also what the future might hold for us. But when looking at Mars, I realized that, I'll be honest, at first I looked at Mars with a little bit of uh, condescension. I was like, it's been done. It's been overdone. Everyone's done Mars. It's fine. Uh, I was wrong to do that. I was wrong to do that. Uh, it provided a fantastic template for me uh, to help design something moving forward. That the things that we've used for Mars to help pave the way for us to move forward into uh, launching something into space, launching ourselves onto a whole other planet, uh, could be employed when deciding to explore it elsewhere. Uh, and I also believe that these technologies can be expanded upon and maybe even further standardized to make things cheaper so that we can grow into space exploration. Uh, I want to thank my, my committee, uh, Dr. C, Dr. T and Dr. G. Thank you very much. Uh, and the department, Dr. Morgan, thank you very much. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm here. But thank you for attending. I, I appreciate you. Dana! <laughs> 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 um, the Xenon Island. I, yes. I'm not familiar with that. So, uh, scrolling a little bit, where's that coming from? Right. Um, like, what is, how much do I bet we have? Okay, we're, we're going to get into the James is not an engineer, but uh, I'm going to tell you that it takes compressed xenon gas and jets it out the back uh, in a very steady stream, helping it uh, slowly accelerate. Uh, the acceleration is actually incredibly slow. Uh, I think if you were to try and go zero to 60 on a xenon ion thruster, it would take you about four days. That's the one, one statistic that came across. I was like, well, that's me. So it takes time. It has to build up. It's built for those long missions to take it nice and slow. Elaborate a little more. It's, it's more common now. Oh, for the for the engines. Yeah. Uh, so they can get you a lot faster. So while it does take you a long time to actually uh, build up that speed, once you hit it, you can actually.
actually achieve uh, a shorter mission duration because we talked about the uh, how the mission the mission time was a factor in the cost as well. Four years to get to Vesta after launching it. It's, it's a lot, but without that thruster, it might have been. Uh, does he question? Uh, how long does it take to match something like the uh, series in Vesta? Uh, Vesta, oh, is, in Vesta is very small, so three months. Okay. Yeah. It took three months for most of the high altitude and low altitude mapping. Uh, whereas Ceres is a little bit larger. Uh, to give you an idea for scale, so the moon, the moon is about the size of New York to Las Vegas, right? Uh, Ceres by itself is maybe about the size of uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania. Uh, Vesta is maybe a little bit of Pennsylvania, not very big. So if we wanted to map something larger, it would take more time. Thank you. How many sensors is on Dawn and high rise comparing together? How many uh, sensor and detectors? Okay, I know that um, Dawn was launched with the gamma ray detector. Uh, they also had the uh, space dust. They were measuring space dust, and they had the uh, optical sensors. Uh, I believe Dawn is, uh, sorry, uh, high rise. Uh, I have to check my paper again, but I believe high rise is the. Um, the visual camera, and I know that the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter also has like uh, more gamma ray detectors for radiation and stuff. Uh, but... Yes. Thank you for this. This was fascinating. Okay. Um, and dredging back my, I, I, as, as you may know, I do actually have a couple of degrees in space engineering. Oh, years on the date at this point. That's so cool! Yeah, so we, we might, I mean, everything that I did is way out of date at this point, but we can still talk about that next Yes! Dig up some of my old books and stuff that's, I have some of engineering designs and stuff, maybe hiding in my mom's shed or something, and I just pull out for you. If you would send on on his name. I think that you should. Okay. Yeah, and, and you can maybe tell us a little bit more about your teacher plan. Um, but uh, dredging up some of this ancient uh, space engineering uh, knowledge, um, I'm wondering about the customizableness of, of the data for different space missions. Yes. Um, because uh, one of the reasons why uh, every different space probe has to be so very different designs is because, as, and in part because of the complexities of actually getting there. Yes. So it takes a, a great deal of computational power, a great deal of, of, of orbital mechanics knowledge um, to figure out how you're going to get things to the place at one time. Obviously, that's why that's going to be so hard for things to make multiple flybys of asteroids. Yes. Because getting, it's not as easy as turning around and coming back. Yeah, you have, you have to like slingshot around other bodies to yes. get there. Yeah, yeah. And, and part of that is that each of these missions has completely different fuel needs. And okay. the more fuel you put on, the more weight you need, so the different yes. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, one of the things I came to this with was this is not the be all end all of the mission. Uh, my philosophy here again was that that scattershot idea that we instead we choose a variety of targets and we go scout those targets uh, and they would be scouted for future exploration. So we would get a cursory knowledge of the body and then send out something more special uh, instead of having to put all of those needs on one single space So this. As far as customizable for fuel, I feel like that. I, again, I have to say I'm not an engineer, uh, so I'm not sure how that would uh, adjust the body of the spacecraft, but the design philosophy, if you will, is uh, really what I'm championing here. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think that that's great about it. I think the that's that 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 If I had more time, I know for a fact I would have um, Gone across the across Pelham Road here and been like, "Hey, uh, engineering department, can we talk? Yeah. Uh, could we have a discussion?" Um, that's that that is a future. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You make a very compelling case for the need to reimagine our space 
expeditions in general to make them more sustainable. Yes. Right. And you just spoke about that in your response to the previous question. I'm wondering then about the Gita, your your Honda Civic of Space <laughs> Cafe. Uh, can you speak briefly to the potential applications of this and their role in society writ large? So when I looked at designing a modular spacecraft, that was actually like the first two words that came up when designing my satellite uh, was it had to be modular. So when it comes to the mission profile, I guess that's what, that's what we should really boil it down to. Uh, the mission profile for Vegeta should be a lot less narrow uh, than what we currently have. Uh, it would be about we send these things out and we can adjust uh, with my uh, system, same system, we can adjust what we are looking to find, uh, what we are looking to um, further explore, because this is not supposed to be the end point. This is the beginning. Uh, if, if anything, and I think maybe something that I should have been a little bit more um, clear about, perhaps, was that it's basically taking us to a two-stage, uh, a two-mission stage, if you will, uh, format, where we go out, we scout it first. Uh, we send equipment out with it that is fit to be scouting. So your mission profile for Venus will be different than your mission profile for Mars, uh, especially for Jupiter or any of the moons around it. So it should be adjusted. And then after that, we get into, okay, what do we want to do with our information? How do we want to keep going? Uh, what equipment should we spend with the next expedition, with the next uh, probe? If I've answered your question clearly enough. Okay. <laughs> Simon, hey, how long did it take you to come up with the name of Jesus and say, stop it? <laughs> <laughs> Don't let my secret out. <laughs> you know me, I wear my inspirations on my sleeve, but about a day. <laughs> it's a day to make it fit. <laughs> uh, seriously, thank you all for being here. This, this has been um, a voyage, if you will. Uh, I really appreciate all of you coming out. Um, if you have further questions for me after this, uh, feel free. Uh, you can hit me up after that. Uh, if you feel that there are more conversations that we need to have, let's do it. So, uh, but other than that, uh, thanks for coming out. And I guess I'm at the wings in front of you. Yes, you are. All right. Okay. Thanks again. Okay.